Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to listen to me on this uh, beautiful evening. Uh, I'm uh, very grateful uh, for the invitation to address this uh, venerable institution. Uh, today I want to talk about inequality. Now this is a very controversial subject and a very complicated one, so I cannot possibly address all aspects of it, but uh, let me try. You know, the pursuit of equality has always been one of the important motor forces of human history. You know, you read about them, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, numerous peasant revolts, urban riots, those millions of industrial strikes, and countless other human conflicts were all driven by the desire to achieve greater equality, however exactly you may define it. But something changed in the 1980s. Under the influence of the ideology commonly known as uh, neoliberalism, lots of people came to accept that inequality is a natural outcome of the differences in productivities of different people and therefore it should not be tampered with. Many politicians and economists have argued that inequality is a non-issue. In particular, my former colleague in Cambridge uh, and now the chief economist at the Citigroup, Professor Willem Bauter, shocked quite a few people by one saying that, and I'm quoting him, poverty bothers me, inequality doesn't, I just don't care. Mitt Romney, the Republican candidate of the 2012 US election campaign, dismissed uh, any discussion of inequality as politics of envy. So there was uh, this uh, the quite unique uh, period of 30, 40 years uh, since the 1980s when inequality was not an issue, but of course uh, things have changed uh, since the financial crisis of 2008. People have belatedly come to realize that in the last few decades of neoliberalism, inequality has risen in most countries, especially in the rich world sometimes to levels that had not been seen since the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, that this is particularly the case in the US and the UK, the inequality levels in these countries today, if you want to see the same level of inequality, you basically have to go back to the early 20th century. And now a lot of people are talking about it, a lot of people are agitating about it. You know, the most telling sign of the change in the, the, the well, what the Germans call zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the time, is that according to some surveys, something like one third of American youngsters, aged between, say, the, the 18 and the, the 30, identify themselves as socialist of some kind. Yeah? No, this is uh, quite amazing because uh, uh, the US is a country in which uh, socialism was uh, such a dirty word that social democrats like Ted Kennedy started calling themselves liberals. Yeah? Now, liberals in European terms mean something completely different. Yeah? Liberals in European terms is uh, Friedrich von Hayek. Yeah? In American terms is uh, Milton Friedman. Yeah? But the uh, American center-left people, social democrats, uh, they just couldn't call themselves uh, socialists, so they started calling themselves liberal, thereby causing this uh, huge confusion in terminology. In that country now, 
you know, I mean, of course, uh, this survey is that, 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 uh, uh, to be taken with a grain of salt, but one third of uh, young people are calling themselves socialists. Eh? Something has uh, changed again. So in this lecture, uh, I would like to talk about the state of inequality, its evolution in the last few decades especially, and discuss how we may deal with it. Well, let's uh, start, start with some basic facts. Uh, you know, of course, uh, in this uh, age of uh, post-truth politics, I mean, the facts are not taken very seriously, but uh, I do. So the, let's uh, look at some uh, basic numbers. I'm not going to talk about many concrete numbers, but uh, the, we, we need to basically, first of all, the, know what has been happening. Eh? So since the 1980s, when a lot of countries abandoned more interventionist policies, known as uh, the mixed economy in the rich countries, import substitution, the, the industrialization strategy in the developing countries. When the, a lot of countries uh, abandoned the, these and uh, started liberalizing their markets and opening their borders uh, to international trade and investment, income inequality started rising because if you let market forces uh, exercise themselves at, uh, strongly, this is uh, what usually happens. So basically in about two-thirds of the countries, inequality has increased uh, since the 1980s. Now, of course, that, that, that inequality statistics are not totally reliable. I mean, in some countries, they are simply not available, probably because it's so bad that they don't want to release it. Yeah? Uh, there are different ways of measuring inequality and so on. So, I mean, this is just a rough yeah, uh, picture. Now, this uh, trend uh, actually the, the was reversed a little bit uh, since uh, the beginning of the 21st century with the falls in inequality in quite a few countries in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. So th that is a positive news, but the falls in these countries have been very small, and these countries still remain very unequal by international standards. So to put you in the picture there, Brazil in the last couple of decades has experienced a fall in inequality. But even after this fall, top 10% of the Brazilian population take three point times more income than what the bottom 40% takes. Yeah? This comparison of top 10% and bottom 40% is uh, known as the Palma ratio, named after my Cambridge uh, colleague, uh, Gabriel Palma who found this, uh, that, uh, have found this uh, that, uh, very interesting regularity that in most countries, well, almost all countries, uh, the middle 50% take more or less an uh, equal share. Yeah? So the difference between different countries is uh, determined really by the relationship between the top 10% and the bottom 40%. Yeah? Anyway, the, this is uh, the Palma ratio. Brazil has a Palma ratio of 3.5. This ratio is around 1 in countries like Sweden and Switzerland, 1.5 in the UK, and 1.8 in the US. Yeah? So that puts you into perspective. Yeah? I mean, Brazil, despite the recent fall in inequality, is still hugely unequal. Yeah? Anyway, when you point out the increase in inequality in many countries. Some people come back and say, yeah, inequality at the national level may have risen, but the world as a whole has become a more equal place. So if you, according to these people, using this uh, notion of global inequality, if you line up 7 billion people in the whole world as if uh, they belong to one country, and measured the uh, income distribution along uh, this uh, the, the, the 7 <coughs> billion people, the world has become more equal in the last couple of decades. Eh? Well, basically what has happened is that a lot of Chinese people have become richer. Eh? 
No, it's not nothing. You know that uh, this uh, that uh, global inequality has uh, that uh, had been rising uh, for <coughs> kind of centuries. Uh, so the fact that it has fallen, although not a lot, is uh, something to celebrate. Hmm? But my problem is that this is well. First of all, even after this fall the global economy remains hugely unequal. If the globe was a country, it will not be even Brazil, it will be South Africa, it will be Namibia, the most unequal countries in the world. I mean, for economists here, Gini coefficient of 0 0.65 kind of you know, huge at that inequality, Brazil's is 0 0.55, so that, that even after this fall, we are still living in a very unequal world. But the more important problem that I have with this uh, the argument is that global inequality is not terribly relevant. Because why does inequality matter? Inequality matters only because you think you belong to that group whose internal inequality is measured. Yeah, yeah so that. Uh, you know, income inequality in China has been rising very rapidly in the last few decades. I'll have a bit more to say about China in a minute. And there's a lot of discontent. Yeah? So you go to China and tell these uh, people who are unhappy with this that, oh, you shouldn't worry about it because the global economies have become more equal. Yeah? Well, thanks to China becoming more unequal. Yeah? And would you be taken seriously? Yeah? You know, I mean, for this uh, Chinese person, he doesn't care whether the income distribution in Brazil is that, 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 uh, much worse than that in China. He doesn't care whether this uh, income distribution in the, this fictitious community called the global community has risen or fallen because that, uh, he doesn't care. Yeah? Do a little thought experiment. You know, if someone told you that there are 55 planets in the whole galaxy that has uh, intelligent beings, but uh, the galaxy is a uh, hugely the unequal place yeah, with Gini coefficient of, I don't know, 0 0.89. Yeah. Would you care? I wouldn't. Yeah. Well, A, I cannot even go to these places. Yeah. And B, you know, that uh, what counts as uh, the delicacy in those uh, the planets are uh, maybe toxin for me. Yeah? It just doesn't matter. Yeah? Okay, there's a slowly emerging sense of a global community, especially thanks to the, this uh, global climate crisis, but we are still far away from there. Yeah? You cannot tell people that you have to be happy with rising inequality in the UK because hey, that, that, that now we are that, that, uh, living in a more equal world. You know? Yeah, I said that I was going to say something about the Chinese case. You know, the rise in inequality when the country first uh, embarked on this uh, reform in the late 70s, early 80s, I think was uh, a very positive thing. You know, the, before that, you had this uh, excessive and counterproductive egalitarianism of uh, the Maoism, yeah? which was uh, the, the not only economically inefficient, but uh, was uh, the really doing damage uh, to society. Yeah? But this is uh, questionable now whether this uh, high inequality is uh, functional anymore. Yeah? Because uh, it's, uh, the China is uh, now a very unequal country. I mean, it's, uh, the income inequality is basically uh, similar to that of the United States. Yeah? And the especially difficult problem is that this rise in inequality happened within just 30 years. You know, of course, uh, there are countries that are far more unequal than China, South Africa, Brazil, you name it. But in those countries, that inequality had been there for the last five centuries. Eh? In China, you are talking about 
moving from you know, the, the basically the communism to the, the US level of uh, inequality in one generation. Now this is a, 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 a huge change and yeah, of course uh, so far, I mean it uh, the hadn't been such a huge problem because uh, when the economy is growing at 8%, 10%, 12%, you know, even the worst of guys are uh, eating a lot of bowl of rice, yeah? They don't really care that uh, what uh, happens uh, with inequality, yeah? But now, you know, inequality is beginning to matter because the economy is slowing down, yeah? Believe me, when the, it the slows down to 3-4% uh, the growth per year, people are going to ask lots of questions, yeah? especially when you're trading on the, the title of socialist republic. Yeah? How would you justify that level of inequality? Yeah? So in that sense, that, uh, China is uh, a bit like a bicycle. Yeah? If you keep pedaling at the, the, the sufficient speed, you will move forward. But if you slow down, you will fall. Yeah? So, you know, the basically the, the, the lesson that, that, that you can draw from uh, the Chinese experience is that, you know, that the relationship between inequality and other variables like economic performance or social stability and so on, they are not linear. You know? I mean, that, that we are too accustomed to this uh, linear thinking. If uh, something is bad, you think uh, more of it will necessarily be bad. You know? If something is good, uh, you think uh, that, uh, that more of it will be necessarily bad, you know? uh, that necessarily good. No, it's not like that. You know? Think about salt. You know? Some of it is absolutely necessary, some more of it will be the, the slightly harmful for health, but will make uh, eating more pleasurable, but too much of it will kill you. you know? So inequalities are like that, you know? I mean, that, that the kind of inequality that regimes like uh, the, the Maoist China or Khmer Rouge are pursued are, I mean, the, well, basically very toxic. You know? But then if you are there, increasing inequality might be a good thing, but after a point, it will become negative. You know? So we are talking about that portion of the curve. You know? Anyway, so why is high inequality bad? Of course, what is high will depend on the country, the stages of development, the culture that the country has, its uh, social structure and so on, so that there's no easy way of uh, the saying from here is high inequality, from here is uh, low inequality. But uh, roughly speaking, I think uh, the, the borderline between high inequality that can become dysfunctional and high inequality that is just there uh, without causing many uh, problems is uh, somewhere around the Mediterranean. Yeah? Uh, what I mean is that uh, the kind of inequality that you have in the Mediterranean countries, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, South Korea has a similar uh, level of uh, income uh, inequality. I mean, that I think is the borderline. Yeah? Countries that have uh, inequalities higher than that, the UK, the US, not to speak of Latin American countries in Africa, I think uh, that is uh, becoming uh, dysfunctional. Of course, uh, this is a very, very uh, rough picture, but uh, that's uh, what I have in mind. Anyway, why is uh, high inequality bad? Well, to begin with, there are various ethical and political arguments. So first of all, ethically, a high degree of inequality is morally unacceptable because a large part of what you earn is down to luck, yeah? to which parents you have been born to, yeah? in which country you have been born. Yeah? rather than what philosophers call just desserts, yeah? coming from your talent or effort. Yeah? Secondly, a group with too many discrepancies between its uh, members cannot function as a true community. Yeah? This is uh, exactly the idea behind uh, Benjamin Disraeli's uh, One Nation Tourism. Yeah? Despite being a Tory prime minister, 
Did you really argue that you need you know, some degree of equality so that we can function as one nation? Yeah? I mean, he, when he was young, uh, he wrote this uh, the novel called Sibyl, which is, uh, I think, a subtitled Tale of Two Nations or something, in which he argued that we are actually living in a country uh, that, that we two nations, not one, and we have to integrate this. Yeah? Thirdly, too much inequality undermines democracy by allowing the rich to exercise disproportionate political influences. This is uh, especially the case if you have a political system that requires a lot of money, like the United States. Yeah? Basically, there your electoral chances are hugely influenced by expensive uh, TV advertising. Yeah? So you have to raise huge amount of money. And where are you going to raise the money? Well, where the money is. Yeah? So you basically have to rely on the financial sector, yeah? uh, rely on the pharmaceutical industry, the defense industry, the oil industry. And then when you get into power, you have to listen to them. Yeah? This uh, is also the case uh, in some uh, of the poor developing countries where there are too many poor people who will willingly sell their votes for a bag of rice. Yeah? Well, you cannot blame them. Yeah? On top of these uh, ethical and political arguments, there are various economic arguments against uh, high inequality. So one well-known channel is that high inequality increases social conflict, which creates instability and uncertainty about future, which naturally discourages investment. Yeah? By definition, investors need stability and predictability yeah? because the returns are in the future. Yeah? If you have a lot of the, the, the social conflict and instability, investment is uh, discouraged and therefore growth suffers. Yeah? Also, high inequality reduces economic growth by creating barriers to social mobility. And these barriers include things like well, expensive education that only a minority can afford, but that you need in order to get a well-paid job. Personal connections. The French sociologist uh, Pierre Bourdieu uh, called this uh, social capital. Yeah, so your father is a friend of you know, someone who runs a big hedge fund. Yeah, you will get easily an internship there, and then from there, you, know, you make your way forward. Yeah? Or it could be the barrier uh, that exists because of the subculture that exists among the elite. Yeah? So in this country, this is a big problem. You know, your accent, yeah? the color of your shoes, yeah? color of your trousers. Yeah? Well, not to speak of color of your skin and so on. Yeah. Now, when social mobility is uh, reduced in this way, able people from poorer backgrounds are excluded from higher end jobs and therefore have their talents wasted, both from individual and social points of view. It also means that some of the people filling the top jobs are not the best that the society, society could have got. Yeah. And if sustained over generations, these barriers make able youngsters from less privileged backgrounds give up even trying for higher-end jobs. Yeah? Now let me uh, tell you this uh, the personal anecdote. Uh, you know, when I first uh, arrived in this country as a graduate student in the mid-1980s, I got to see this uh, BBC documentary program on the British uh, class system. And in one of the episodes, they were interviewing this uh, old couple. The husband used to be a coal miner. I think it was in Yorkshire, because I couldn't understand his accent uh, at the time. <laughs> but uh, from what I could gather, 
really was that, uh, shocking to me because that, you know, this old couple had this son, unlike the other sons, uh, studied very hard, went to university, and became a high school teacher. And this couple were angry. They basically called him a traitor. How can a working class lad become a middle class person? You know, that shows the you know, power of uh, the British uh, the class system. Yeah? I mean, the, the, the country has been doing a lot to kind of weaken it, but it's not easy, you know. But uh, in South Korea, those days, uh, the, unlike today, when there was very high social mobility, you know, this uh, kind of uh, reaction was unthinkable. Yeah? Because, yeah, I mean, if uh, the, the uh, son of a minor became a school teacher, the parents uh, will be overjoyed. Yeah? He's uh, finally moved up. Yeah? We don't want our children to uh, be doing this hard job uh, that we've been doing. Yeah? But no, I mean, that, uh, because uh, the British uh, class system had been so kind of uh, ossified, yeah? people basically started seeing social mobility as a negative thing. Yeah? Anyway, so the, for these the, the reasons, you know, the, the majority of uh, statistical the studies have found a negative correlation between a country's degree of inequality and its uh, economic growth rate. Comparison of the same society over time also shows that inequality has negative effects on growth. You know. In the last few decades, uh, inequality in the rich countries, uh, the so-called OECD countries, uh, the, the increase in almost all countries, but then in almost all of them, investment fell and economic growth fell. You know, because that, uh, initially when they implemented these policies that were going to increase uh, inequality, the argument was that yes, uh, it might increase inequality, but it will you know, allow people at the top to invest more, create more income, and make everyone better off uh, in absolute terms. Yeah? This was uh, known as the trickle-down argument. Yeah? It's not a stupid argument, you know, that you always have to look at the second round and third round effects of anything. But unfortunately, this has not happened. Yeah? Basically, the people at the top took the money, didn't invest uh, with that money. Actually, they invested even less uh, than they used to. And then the, the we have uh, economic growth rate in the last uh, few decades, which is uh, the basically half that of uh, the, the growth rate of the 1950s uh, to the 70s period. Yeah? Recently, the, the books like The Spirit Level have argued that inequality leads to poor social outcomes in terms of health, education, and crime. And note that this is uh, the, the negative outcomes on top of the sheer effect of higher inequality producing a higher number of poor people. Yeah? So poor people, we all know, have poor performance in the, the, these uh, social indicators. So if you have a more unequal society, you are going to have more poor people. Yeah? But that, that, that kind of thing that, that, that Wilkinson and Pickett uh, talk about in the spirit level is on top of this uh, effect, you have even more negative performance in this regard. I don't have time to go into the argument, but that, I mean, that a lot of studies have uh, confirmed uh, their uh, findings. Yeah? Okay, now, having seen that in inequality has risen, how about the argument that, yes, uh, inequality has risen, but this is, even if you don't like it, the, the result of fundamental changes in the economy in terms of technology and globalization. Yeah? So we have seen recent changes in technologies that have made high-end skills, especially in IT skills, far more valuable than before. So this has increased wage gaps. Yeah? 
globalization has reduced the value of workers in the rich countries because now they have to compete against uh, workers from China and Vietnam. Yeah? So people who make this point argue that insofar as we should not turn the technological clock back or reverse the process of globalization, we should accept this uh, increase in inequality. This uh, has been uh, argued by many people. I think uh, there are serious uh, problems with this uh, line of argument. First of all, the argument assumes that liberalized markets reward people according to their contributions to the economy. But there are a lot of rules that look fair but are actually favoring the rich. And I'm not talking about you know, blatantly rigged rules like uh, the so-called legacy admissions in American universities. Yeah? Basically, the deal is if uh, your parents or the grandparents went to that university, they let you in with very lenient condition. Yeah? So one anecdotal evidence I that, that read uh, in the New York Times is that this Latino woman who came from quite underprivileged background, you know, she took like you know 15 AP courses uh, this is uh, known as advanced placement so you study at higher level than your colleagues yeah and it's uh, that that uh, quite important in getting admissions uh, to top universities that uh, that so she got into Cornell and when she i mean met someone in the, the canteen in the first uh, few days of uh, the, the, her university this other girl a didn't take any AP course and B when she was asked uh, how come I mean very openly said that oh I'm a legacy eh? my father and my grandfather went to Cornell so that, that she just uh, basically got in uh, without any AP course yeah, yeah so that uh, uh, or, or basically American universities take donation and let yeah uh, stupid kids in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th uh, th in many countries, uh, there are these uh, openly rigged rules, yeah. But I'm not talking about those. I'm, but what I'm talking about is that the rules that are ostensibly even-handed, but that are not, yeah. So, for example, if you take into account extracurricular activities in university admissions, as American or Korean universities do, you're actually favoring the rich children, yeah. No, outwardly it's a good thing, you know, you don't want uh, people who just kind of uh, study, yeah? you don't want people who just think about themselves. Yeah, yeah so that, that there are all these uh, the American kids, uh, you know, that I, I do graduate admissions in Cambridge and that, that uh, they, they send this uh, personal statement and, you know, I mean, uh, they're only 22, but they've already kind of you know, built orphanages in the, the five African countries and uh, dug well in the three Asian countries. Yeah, served in three soup kitchens in New York. Uh, did an internship at a hedge fund. Yeah, uh, the plays at uh, the violin. Yeah, is a top uh, American football player. You know, I puke. Yeah. <laughs> no, because uh, this is not real. Yeah. I mean, their parents uh, did that for them, yeah? Whereas uh, if you're the uh, 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 son of a, I don't know, poor immigrant running a corner shop, yeah? You might have to uh, spend all your spare time uh, 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 minding the shop, yeah? Taking care of your younger siblings, yeah? Maybe uh, do some extra uh, uh, work in the local supermarket or something, yeah? You don't have time for those other things, yeah? Yeah, so uh, basically the point is that this is uh, like a race in which uh, there may be no head start. Yeah? Everyone starts from the equal starting point, yeah? running according to the same rule. But where some kids have only one leg, others have only one eye. Yeah? It's not a fair race. Yeah? So if you want a truly fair race, uh, you need not only to apply the same rules, but making sure that the underlying capabilities of the contestants are similar. Yeah? 
Now, when I say this, people say, oh, but uh, how about the, the level playing field? You, know? you have to have a level playing field. You cannot have a you know, different treatment for different people. You know? Yes, uh, if uh, the players are equal, you know, uh, it will be grossly unfair and totally unacceptable if you had a level playing field in a football game where the Brazilian team you know, attacks uh, from down the hill and the Argentinian team attacks from up the hill. Yeah, yeah that's unfair. Yeah? However, if uh, one team is a bunch of 12-year-old uh, girls, and the other team is the uh, Argentinian national team, I think it's only fair that uh, the Argentinians are made to attack from down the hill, yeah? and the girls attack uh, from up the hill. Yeah? Of course, uh, you don't see that kind of tilted playing ground, exactly because that, uh, these unequal players are not even allowed to compete against each other. Yeah? So that the football has these age groups, uh, gender division. Yeah? Football is uh, not the only game uh, that does that. Yeah? In that, uh, things like Boxing, wrestling, weightlifting, you have uh, weight classes. Yeah? And do you know how narrow these weight classes are? In the lower weight uh, the, of uh, boxing, the weight classes are typically between 2 and 3 pounds, yeah? 1 and 1.5 1 and 1 kilos. Yeah? So in boxing, you think uh, a guy who's uh, 2 kilos heavier than the other guy hitting the lighter guy is so unfair that they are structurally separated into different weight classes. Yeah? And in the other sphere of life, uh, you think uh, it's uh, okay if, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know, someone the, the, the who the was uh, malnourished uh, when he was a kid because he comes from a very poor family in India, competes on equal terms with, I don't know, son of uh, the uh, uh, Ambani the, the family, you know. So the point is that equality of opportunity, that is everyone being subject to the same rule, is not enough. Yeah? For a truly fair society, you need social measures to ensure some degree of equality of outcome, which is necessary for guaranteeing similarities and capabilities among the next generation of uh, contestants. Yeah? Unless you are going to become like North Korea, where every kid is raised in a, a collective cliche. Yeah? Yeah. Then it's that, that uh, okay, yeah? but I don't want that. Yeah? Probably the, most of you don't want that. Yeah? Okay, empirically, those who try to explain the recent increase in inequality as an outcome of objective economic forces, like technology and globalization, has a problem because you have a few countries where inequality hasn't risen very much. Yeah? So in the last few decades, in countries like Canada and the Netherlands, inequality has risen, but only very little. Yeah? In the case of France and Switzerland, the evidence, uh, the, the data is uh, the, the rather incomplete, but there's uh, plenty of evidence that suggests that inequality has actually fallen. Yeah? Now, this kind of thing uh, should not have happened if it was all due to some objective forces. Yeah? This uh, outcome has happened because countries have done things to control inequality. Yeah? And indeed, that uh, we are <coughs> already doing a lot to control inequality, especially in the rich countries. Yeah? So in most uh, rich countries, uh, the, they are already taxing and redistributing a huge amount of income through the welfare state. Yeah? I mean, this is uh, particularly the case uh, with the European countries. So before tax and redistribution, most uh, European countries, Austria, Germany, Portugal, UK, Spain, they have uh, income inequality that is as high or even higher than that of the US. Yeah? But they tax and redistribute so much more than the US, they end up being much more equal. In addition to reducing inequality through the welfare state, countries can limit the very ability of the market to generate inequality. My own native country, South Korea, is a good example. Mm -hmm. You have this very interesting phenomenon that before 
tax and redistribution, South Korea is actually the most equal country in the OECD, which probably means one of the most equal countries in the world. Yeah? However, it uh, doesn't tax and redistribute uh, so much that it ends up being more than average unequal among the OECD countries. Yeah? Switzerland is a bit like that. I mean, not as much as uh, the Korea. Japan used to be like that, although Japan has uh, moved away from the model. So in these countries, uh, basically what they do is uh, to restrict uh, the, the ability of the markets uh, to generate uh, inequality through regulations and business uh, practices. Eh? So in the, these countries, you have a lot of laws uh, protecting small farms, uh, small shops, and small comp manufacturing companies. They have uh, business customs that keep the wage gaps between managers and workers small. Top manager salaries are low by international standards. And interestingly, managers are not as protected from corporate restructuring as American or British ones are. You know, that, that in the 2015, the biggest uh, shipbuilding company in South Korea, Hyundai Heavy Industries, started uh, the restructuring the company to fend off uh, the Chinese uh, competition. The first thing it did was to sack 30% of uh, management. Yeah? No, this is unthinkable in the US and the UK. Yeah? Managerial jobs are protected. Yeah? It's only the, the blue collar workers uh, who suffer. So, you know, in Korea, that, that, I mean, there are these uh, business practices uh, that yeah, uh, reduce the gap between the top and the, the people lower down. So, anyway, that, that the, to conclude, the bad news uh, is that in many, although not all countries, including this country, inequality has reached a uh, level that is uh, uh, dysfunctional, yeah? ethically, politically, economically, and so socially. The good news is that there is nothing inevitable about this. A lot of things can be done and are being done to reduce inequality without harming the economy and society. You know, indeed, I hope uh, that my lecture today have helped you realize that the biggest enemy of reform is the belief that whatever is happening must be happening because it is inevitable. Yeah. It is not. Yeah. Inequality can be controlled. It was, that, that used to be controlled. It is uh, still controlled in many countries. I think uh, that <coughs> I would urge you to the, the think about this uh, in a more the kind of uh, uh, proactive way. You know, the, there might be yeah, all these uh, technological trends and changes in global patterns of production and trade that yeah, shape uh, your opportunities. But exactly where you end up are not determined by those things. Yeah? It's that they're determined by your own action yeah? in terms of government policy, social consensus, yeah? corporate uh, that, uh, strategy, and uh, so on. Thank you very much. So thank you for being with us today and thank you for that talk. I think we'll move straight to questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question, just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Yeah, we can go to the front row. I was just wondering whether you'd be able to elaborate on what you thought was ailing Korea, South Korea's economy right now and um, whether maybe that had any relation to some of the issues you talked about in the UK and the US of social class inequality and the rise of those phenomena in South Korea? Well, I don't know. I mean, that the answer to that, uh, if I'm going to give it in a form that is comprehensible to people who are not really interested in South Korea uh, might be the too esoteric. But yes, uh, the basically what uh, South Korea is uh, going through is uh, this uh, transition problem. Yeah? Because uh, the it used to 
until the <coughs> mid early 1990s used to have this uh, model that was uh, totally dedicated uh, to uh, rapid economic development through uh, very aggressive uh, state intervention. And yeah, I mean, the, the economics was, I mean, it was a bit like uh, China today. It was uh, growing at 8%, 10%, yeah? although the, it uh, had uh, rather low inequality. Yeah? So there's a big difference between what uh, Korea and, well, before that, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan did uh, before China. They were growing at uh, the Chinese rate. But then their inequality was actually flat or even falling. Yeah? So the, they the very uniquely achieved this uh, the, the growth with equity, as uh, people put it. Unfortunately, that uh, the rapid uh, growth period uh, has come to an end uh, for various reasons. And then now we have uh, this uh, terrible uh, situation in which uh, we haven't built other institutions that would allow us to cope with the changed uh, economic and social circumstances. Eh? So we have, uh, at the moment, a very small welfare state. It's uh, the second smallest in the whole of OECD after Mexico. We spend only about 10% of uh, GDP on social welfare, whereas the US spends 19%. The OECD average is uh, 21. You know, countries like uh, Finland and France uh, spent uh, 29, 31%. Now, small welfare state was OK when we were growing fast. So a lot of jobs were created. When we had this uh, extended family network, where your extended family basically works as a uh, quasi-welfare state, yeah? Now. That has disappeared, and then people have become very vulnerable. So this is why suddenly that, 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 that we have literally the highest suicide rate in the OECD. I mean, until the mid-90s, our suicide rate was below the OECD average. Now it's by far the highest, three times the OECD average, because basically that, that people when they have misfortune you know, in the form of illness, you know, unemployment, retirement. They have uh, nothing to lean on. Yeah? So it actually, the, the suicide rate is uh, higher for the older people over 50, yeah? because our state pension is this big. And you know, there's uh, the no extended family support anymore. We have uh, now one of the lowest uh, birth rates in the world because uh, we haven't built a system where women could have a job and a child. Yeah? In the old days, if you're working, probably your mother-in-law yeah, or your mother would have uh, taken care of the child. Now you can afford it. Yeah? So yeah, we are in a very that, 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 uh, tricky situation. Do you think President Moon's um, attempts to reunify the North are misguided that he should be focusing on his, own, his, own, his country's own economic issues rather than giving like, a teacher? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the reunification with the North is I mean, far away in the future. I mean, it's not going to happen. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, what he's doing is uh, to create the kind of atmosphere. But then I don't think he's uh, the, the naive enough to believe that, that this is something that he can actually do anything about, yeah? I just wanted to touch on mm. your concern there with making your answer comprehensible to someone that wasn't an expert. That's, That's right, yeah. something you've touched on and in economics in general uh -huh. in the field and something you've actually been criticised for, making things like 23 things they don't tell you about mm -hmm. capitalism comprehensible to the masses. Why do you think that's so important in economics? Well, uh, you know, like it or not, uh, economics uh, has uh, become a bit like a Catholic theology in medieval Europe. You know? It has uh, basically become the language of the rulers. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you don't speak economics, you cannot participate in any debate. Yeah? 
especially because in the last few decades of uh, neoliberalism, we have been encouraged and sometimes even forced uh, to think everything in economic terms. Yeah? So when you're trying to protect, I don't know, a library or a museum, you have to make this economic argument. You know, This will, I don't know, in encourage learning and uh, increase uh, the people's uh, intelligence and our productivity. You know? Why should you do that? Yeah? <laughs> Unfortunately, that, uh, you have to. So the increasingly, the, the, the being able to speak economics is important. But then, of course, that, that they are not going to let you speak it yeah? mm. in the exact same way that uh, the Vatican banned the translation of uh, the Bible into local languages uh, in the medieval times. Yeah? So unless you belong to this uh, priesthood of uh, the kind of uh, people who were trained in Latin, yeah? or unless you were from extremely privileged privileged background and had a personal tutor to teach you Latin, you can even read uh, the Bible. Yeah, yeah and uh, once that, uh, you create this uh, body of knowledge which is uh, not accessible to other people, then you can uh, uh, just kind of, well, basically bully other people into accepting your argument because other people cannot really understand you. Now, unfortunately, you know, the, the worm is uh, turning because now people say we don't want experts. Yeah? No, this is very dangerous. Yeah? You need expertise. Yeah? I mean, uh, if uh, someone, I don't know, asked uh, me to conduct a heart surgery because we don't need expertise, yeah? I mean <laughs> you cannot have uh, that kind of situation. But the so called experts, especially in the area of economics, have uh, behaved so arrogantly. Now we have people kind of uh, the overreacting and saying that we don't believe in expertise, which is uh, very dangerous. Yeah? No, Brexit is a great example, you know. In the Brexit debate, uh, well, declaration of interest, I'm not a UK citizen. I still have my South Korean passport, so I have no personal stake in this. Yeah? But, you know, in the Brexit debate, what was the argument of the Remain side, mainly supported by, you know, economists, and business people. Yeah? I mean, I, that, I have this uh, picture where the David Cameron was making this speech uh, with uh, someone holding this check yeah? uh, in the sum of uh, 3,400 pounds because uh, some genius made this calculation that, that, that with the, 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 the UK's departure from the European Union, an average Br British household will be worth off by 3,400 uh, 3, pounds. Yeah? Well, first of all, how do you even calculate the sum? Because you haven't even done the deal. Yeah? You don't even know what the deal is. Yeah? And secondly, even if you somehow could uh, calculate this, you know, that this is just an average sum. Yeah? I mean, some people will gain from it. Some people will lose from it. So someone might say, yeah, I mean, that 3,400, that's uh, average. I'm going to gain because I'm going to kick out all the poles yeah, from my the labor market. Yeah? And thirdly, however misguided that they think that, that, that these notions are, you know, people care about things like you know, sovereignty, you know, national identity. Yeah? But uh, economists have assumed that people will always vote on the basis of their wallet. Yeah? Yeah, so this is the kind of uh, the tunnel vision that this uh, the exclusion of uh, the, the, the so-called economic experts uh, from ordinary people have uh, created. Yeah? And now it has uh, the, the, the backfired completely. And now the, the whole idea of expertise is uh, the, the discredited. Yeah? I think it's uh, very important that yeah, uh, ordinary citizens uh, the know economics. Yeah? Yeah, and you know, don't, don't be shy about it because, uh, you know, when you think about it, people have very strong opinions about lots of things despite having any qualification, yeah? <laughs> no, I bet uh, that uh, you have uh, strong opinions about, yeah, American uh, foreign policy in the Middle East, yeah? Yeah? gay marriage, uh, climate change, yeah? Yeah, I have my views on the American uh, foreign policy, but what do I know about international relations, yeah? I took one international relations course 
as a second year undergraduate uh, in South Korea back in 1983. And my crusty old professor was uh, using a textbook from the 1960s. Yeah? <laughs> so what little I know about internal religions is 50 years old. Yeah? But then I still that, that pronounced it, that, that my opinion. But when it comes to economics, my professional colleagues have been so successful in persuading other people that this stuff is so difficult, you wouldn't understand it even if you try to explain it to you. Then now people say, ah, oh, yeah, economics, I don't know. Yeah? Yeah, that's for the experts. Yeah? So that, that we have to change this. Yeah? We, unless uh, you learn some economics, you cannot be a responsible democratic citizen. Yeah? I'm not talking about necessarily reading a book on economics. Yeah? I mean, uh, knowing some basic notions yeah, about you know, the output, employment, productivity, you know, uh, unemployment, things like that. Yeah? So, well, I could go on, but uh, let's yeah, move on to Does anyone else other questions. Question? Can we go to the hand? Yeah, at the end of the row. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, Professor Chang. That was, uh, was fascinating. Uh, my name is Dylan Barry. I'm doing the MPhil in economics here, and I'm from South Africa, so the question of inequality is, mm. uh, is close to home. Um, in 2017, uh, Walter Schneidel published a book called uh, The Great Leveller, and his thesis was that, looking through the last 250 years, um, the only real significant reductions in inequality have been as a consequence of war and revolution. Um, and sort of welfare state and welfare policies have managed to manage inequality over short periods of time. Um, but the real reductions have come mm -hmm. from violence. Um, in that context, how do you think we get better at achieving significant reductions in inequality without resorting to violence? Mm. Yeah, no, I think uh, that we have uh, learned our lessons, yeah? Because, uh, yeah, in the old days, unless you had a revolution, unless you had uh, land reform, you know, unless you had a civil war, you know, you're not going to the, the fundamentally change uh, the distribution of uh, wealth and uh, income. Yeah? But the, over time, we have uh, become uh, quite good at it, yeah? Now, the most uh, telling example is that, uh, you know, for example, Germany and Norway have wealth distribution that is more unequal than that of uh, Thailand and Malaysia. Yeah? But when it comes to income distribution, they are far more equal. Yeah? So basically, the, the, the Germans and the Norwegians have uh, even created this uh, mechanism that will prevent the, the wealth inequality from spilling too much into income inequality. And then, yeah, within the realm of uh, income, they have developed all sorts of uh, the, the tax and redistribution policies. You know, as I said earlier, I mean, Germany, before these things, uh, the, is as unequal as the United States. Eh? So the, actually, we have uh, developed a uh, huge uh, the, the array of measures uh, to deal with this. Uh, so you know, I mean, it's a good thing, you know, that we don't have to have a war and, you know, bloodbath, yeah, uh, to the, the make uh, society more equal. Yeah, yeah and that, 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 that in that uh, context, that uh, I may just add a footnote that, you know, the first welfare state measures were implemented not by a socialist, it was implemented by a arch-conservative Otto von Bismarck, yeah? No, because uh, he was intelligent enough to see that to prevent socialism, which he hated, we actually need to reform capitalism. So, you know, it's uh, from that kind of uh, perspective uh, that uh, we have to see this. Uh, it's uh, not just technical tinkering, you know. I mean, to put it starkly, I mean, if you really want to avoid, yeah, uh, revolution, avoid the rise of, well, re-rise of fascism and things like that, uh, we have to do something with you know, these uh, more kind of uh, moderate uh, policy measures. Eh? Can we go to the hand at the back? Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering uh, whether uh, whether automation will lead, in your opinion, to more or less inequality. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me like both uh, 
are possible. Um, and it also seems to me from an admittedly clueless perspective that we are currently on the traje trajectory toward more inequality uh, with regards to automation and algorithm mm -hmm. uh, algorithmization. So what would you, if you can agree with that, what would you recommend for concrete like policy proposals to shift it toward more equality yeah, um, yeah. as a consequence of yeah. automation? Thank you. Yeah, first of all, before I begin to answer the question, I must point out that you know, automation is nothing new. You know, I mean, uh, it's been there for at least uh, 300 years. You know, that, uh, it's been, I mean, throughout the history of capitalism, it's getting more attention because of the fact that now it's uh, beginning to affect white collar work. Basically, it's uh, beginning uh, likely to affect the work that is done by friends or people who write about these things, yeah? No, because that, that uh, until recently, you know, when the workers uh, tried to strike against a uh, plant closure and so on, the financial journalists, economists, uh, they kept saying, no, uh, this is uh, the, the what capitalism is, yeah? I mean, don't be uh, a Luddite, you know, that, uh, don't uh, uh, try to prevent progress, yeah? But now that this is uh, going to affect uh, the law and accounting and, you know, basically the kind of jobs uh, that they, their friends do, they want their children to do, suddenly they are worried about automation, yeah? So that I, I that smell rank class uh, hypocrisy there. But, yeah, having said that, yes, I mean, that, that, that when, when you have this uh, that new technologies emerging that are going to make uh, existing skills uh, obsolete, you inevitably have uh, periods of uh, the conflict, yeah? because there'll be big losers and winners. But uh, once again, that, uh, like uh, the inequality outcome, the employment outcome of uh, this uh, technical change that, uh, is uh, subject to the kind of uh, human intervention. Yeah? So, well, first of all, the society can and should control what kind of technologies that we are going to develop. Yeah? So instead of uh, developing, I don't know, killer robots, yeah, we could try to develop robots uh, that can work in, say, deep coal mines in South Africa, yeah? I mean, the, the Arctic uh, mines in Russia, you know. Uh, that we could uh, that try to uh, focus more on uh, developing robots uh, that can help uh, take care of uh, old people because uh, the, the world is aging, you know. So society can uh, direct these things. And secondly, the thing about automation is that, you know, uh, this is uh, the, the another example of uh, the secondary tertiary impacts of initial that uh, change yeah? because that yes uh, automation will destroy some jobs but it will also create some new jobs yeah so to put it kind of simplistically but graphically you know that, that as uh, robots uh, replace uh, workers you will need uh, more workers uh, who will do robot maintenance yeah? I mean as uh, the people are released uh, from heavy physical work uh, they can do more creative things yeah so you know, once again, that, that creating those jobs will require certain policy interventions, especially in terms of retraining of workers. Yeah? But uh, that these uh, can be done, these have been done. You know, for example, Sweden is uh, one of the most uh, robotized economies in the world. But Swedish workers uh, do not fight robots, yeah? because that, that they have a very good uh, publicly subsidized uh, retraining system in which uh, that you could even go to university again uh, to get new skills. Swedish workers are not afraid of robots. Yeah? Whereas uh, in America, uh, of course, uh, most uh, workers, uh, there are powerless even to resist because uh, that only uh, less than 10% of the workers are unionized, but the unionized ones uh, will fight tooth and nail because that uh, once they lose their job, they even cannot go to hospital, yeah? they don't have uh, medical insurance. Yeah? There's a very poor retraining program. So once they lose their job as an auto worker, steel worker, 
you know, do, do, do how many the, the ex steel workers do you know who have retrained themselves into, I don't know, IT engineers? Yeah? I mean, it doesn't happen automatically. Yeah? So, yeah, I would say that, that uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's such, to make a general point, you know, technology defines the realm of possibility, but exactly where you end up within the realm is up to you. Yeah? So automation uh, should be seen like that. Yeah? Once again, it's uh, not inevitable. Yeah? I think we've got time for one more question. Has anyone else got? Yeah, if we go to the hand in the white shirt. At the front, just here. Uh, Professor Chang, my question is about kind of the global consensus on what it needs to be done for development of underdeveloped economies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm also South African and there's a good likelihood that the country will head to an IMF bailout somewhere within the next decade because mm -hmm. the government is increasingly having to uh, use a lot of money to pay off its interest on its loans. Um, Given the current policies of the World Bank and the IMF, uh, what do you think the outcome would be of IMF policies as they currently stand on inequality in the country, should they take an IMF bailout? Yes, uh, IMF uh, actually has uh, changed uh, quite a lot. I mean, uh, it is uh, now openly talking about inequality. It is uh, uh, revising its uh, positions uh, on some key policy issues like capital account control and so on. Having said that, yes, I mean, the, the, that is more at the top and at the research division. People say country directors are still behaving as if it's uh, 1995, so you know, that, that I reserve my judgment there. But, you know, basically my view is that uh, development cannot be achieved without fundamental transformation of the productive structure. Yeah? Insofar as uh, countries keep relying on the primary commodities, you know, insofar as they rely on uh, cheap labor, they'll never uh, be able to develop their economies. I mean, they may be able to reduce poverty, but uh, that's not the same as uh, development. You know? And uh, yeah, countries like South Africa, you know, in the early 1960s, South Africa was literally the most industrialized economy outside the core capitalist bloc of North America, Europe, and Japan, yeah? literally the most industrialized country. Yeah? Today, you know, it's uh, the, not even on the map uh, in terms of uh, uh, manufacturing industry. Yeah? So, I mean, the country has uh, the kind of underlying capabilities, although it, they, they have uh, decayed a lot. So the, for a country like that, you know, the, it will be I mean, uh, m more a matter of, you know, reviving and revitalizing what you had, yeah, and then the, the charting a new course. It is going to be a lot more difficult for poorer economies of Africa, Asia, and parts of Latin America, where even running a factory is a struggle. Yeah, so. I mean, different countries have uh, different challenges, but the common theme is that you need productive transformation. Yeah? Unless you are producing, I don't know, high value, high productivity products, you are not going to that, uh, make uh, uh, life comfortable for everyone. Yeah? Thank you very much. Yeah. Can everyone join me in thanking Dr. Hadun Chang?